and you can walk out this door right now after I say this because you're going to get the entirety of what I need to say in this, okay? If you are not daily, personally praying in, 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 in at least a half an hour of prayer before you try to go do your job as a, or volunteer work or anything else, I don't care if you're a volunteer or full-time employee or whatever else, before you go try to do ministry, before you go try to teach a class, before you go try to invest in other people's lives, before you run a program event or a class, any of those things, before you do that, if you're not praying, you need to stop the idea that you can actually do those things well and then go pray. And if that continues on where you're not praying and you're trying to do all this work stuff, you probably should quit your job and learn how to pray. Is that bold enough? And the reason I say that is because you have no ability to do what you need to do without God being the center of every part of your ministry. Now, does that mean I perfectly accomplish what I'm talking? No, I'm preaching to myself right now. When I get up here and say that kind of stuff, I'm like, okay, I better work on my prayer life a little bit more. Absolutely. Every single time I say something like that, okay? And sometimes God, I have, I have this, okay, you guys know what charisms are? Gifts of the Holy Spirit given for the good of the others, not necessarily you, for others. Okay, I have four very strong charisms, and one of them is prophecy, and it gets me in a lot of trouble. Because you know what prophecy is? It's telling God what God wants him to hear. And sometimes God wants me to hear what comes out of my own stupid mouth. Okay, so I'm talking to myself here. So let's talk about a little bit of history. Anybody ever heard of this event at the early church called Pentecost? It was kind of a big deal. I mean, it was the birth of the church. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit. It changed the apostles. It empowered them to go out. I mean, think about the change that happened at Pentecost. You have these men and women in the upper room who are huddled together scared. They're scared. They're huddled together scared, waiting on God to become present. Waiting, huddled. And here, and, and the promise of the Holy Spirit, he says, wait. He told them to wait. Jesus told them to wait for the Holy Spirit, right? Stay in Jerusalem until it comes, until the advocate. And so here... It happens. Pentecost happens after weeks of waiting. And when it happens, a powerful thing happened. They were changed. They're no longer scared. Or, excuse me, they may still have felt fear. But that wasn't the determining factor of what they were going to do. What happened? What happened at Pentecost? You tell me. Because I have to drink some water. These allergies are killing me here in Steubenville. You people, I don't know how you'll live here. Fire? What else happened? Is that what you, what did you say? Claritin. Oh, Claritin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Clarifier. Yes. <clears throat> Clar I did take some Claritin this morning. It ain't working. I got this stuff all over. I was sleeping last night. And I was clenching my jaw because I couldn't breathe through my nose. Ugh. Woke up with a headache. It's like, okay, Jesus, do something with my pain. Give it to the people I'm going to talk to. Not the pain, <laughs> the grace. Not the pain, the grace. Okay. So we had fire and we had what else? Because apparently God's speaking through Claritin. What? Wind. Wind. Yeah. We had, and we had what happened through those things, those signs and wonders that happened in that upper room. What ended up happening to them? Transformation. In what way? Besides just being bold and having some courage, what else happened to them? Empowered. Say it loud. Empowered, Empowered what else? Convicted. Mm. Convicted. That's, that's a good word for what I'm looking for. Yeah. They couldn't stay there anymore. Did you notice that? The mission starts when they receive the Holy Spirit. And remember... You got that same Holy Spirit. Let me say this again. You have that same Holy Spirit. In your baptism and your confirmation, all of what the apostles were given has been given to you. The question is not whether you have it. The question is what? What you do with it. 
So this Holy Spirit's come upon them, and they feel cha- they, they know they're changed, and they say, let's do something about it, and they go out. Friends, if you want to be great evangelists, it starts with the interior life. I mean, you can leave here, take the, those things I've said, and go read Soul of the Apostolate, and basically you're going to be told the same thing. You have no power in your ministry and evangelization and discipleship without prayer, without the interior life. And it is a struggle. I know that. I've struggled for decades trying to pray and being distracted and having problems, and it's not perfect. And sometimes I go do it, and it's kind of just a chore, you know, and I'm just going to chug along and check off the list and get my prayer done. And some days I don't want to do it, and we're going to talk about some of that stuff, okay? But let's start right here in the fact that Prayer undergirded everything of the early church, including our Lord. Before he starts his ministry, what does he go do? He prays for 40 days in the desert. I mean, first of all, props to him. I ain't praying 40 days. I don't care about those Ignatian retreats for like 40 days, you know. I'm a lay person who is married and got kids and a job and got bills to pay. Nobody's going to give me 40 days to go pray by myself. It's just not happening. So I'm okay. I'm sorry if you're a priest or a religious and you've been able to go do a 40-day retreat. I don't know a single lay ministry person who is still working that has ever been given the opportunity to go do something like that. Do you guys know of anybody that's been able to do that? You do? Oh, for goodness sake, I'm going to come work for you. (laughs) So it's the rare exception at at the best, right? So the point being is that that may not be for you, but what about your daily prayer? So Sister Mary Michael Fox and I were talking yesterday, so she grabbed me because she, she likes me because we're both, you know, kind of fiery. And she grabs me and she says, Marcel, I'm doing this stuff. She's doing the retreat track, okay? And then the retreat track, she said something this morning, and she said, she, she actually used my name. She goes, Marcel told me I could say this. I said, well, Sister, I'm going to say the same thing in my talk. She said, should I say this, that these people who are trying to do ministry and not even pray in a half an hour, they need to stop and go pray for half an hour. I said, absolutely, you need to say that. In fact, they probably should quit their jobs. So she used my name even saying that. So look, Sister Mary Michael has given me the stamp of approval, okay? So if you've got a problem with me, you've got, a sister, you've got to go talk to Sister Mary Michael, okay? So think about this. All these evangelists have had deep, deep prayer lives. Think about them. Who, who's your favorite saint? Name, name some saints. St. Paul, okay? Mother Teresa, okay? We'll stop right there with those two. Tell me about St. Paul's interior life. What kind of things did he write in his letters that we know about from St. Paul about prayer? Yeah, he, 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 first of all, he talked about suffering quite a bit. What kind of things did he suffer? I mean, he's got lists, right? You know, the casting outs, the shipwrecks, the, the floggings. He had the thorn in the side. You know, all these things that St. Paul did. And what did he do with those? Did he waste them? Did he, he complain about them? A little bit. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's human. But he offered them back for other people too, right? He used them for the good of his ministry. And he spent time in prayer. You know he knew the scriptures, didn't he? He was a, he was a good Pharisee, and the Pharisees knew their scriptures upside and down. He could quote the scriptures from memory and be able to write them out, right? The Psalms and others, we have those references in his letters that were scribed for him. Paul was a man of prayer, Right? Can we all agree upon that? Mother Teresa. If you've ever read Mother Teresa's stuff, you know she suffered greatly from dark, dark things, from having desolation constantly for years, decades upon decades of desolation. If you guys, if you're into Ignatian prayer, and you know consolation and desolation, desolation is this, this dark feeling that God isn't present to you, even though he is, okay? The reality is God is always present to us, right? But you don't feel it spiritually, mentally, emotionally. You feel like God's presence has been removed. That's a desolation that Ignatius talks about, okay? And when you're feeling desolation, it's hard because God feels far away. God may not even feel real. Now imagine having that for decade upon decade in the midst of trying to serve the poor in Calcutta and running a religious order and the politics that were being lobbed at her and the other things. What did she do every day? She would say, that, you know, that they'd sometimes the sisters would come to her and say, well, sister, we can't spend an hour a day. and We've got so many poor to go serve. We've got so many people who are dying on the streets. What did she say in response to, we can't spend an hour a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament in our daily prayer? 
spend two. Now, why would she say something of that kind of, wait a minute, if they don't go out there and serve the poor, nobody's going to do it in these cities. Those people could die. Well, the reason why is because their death is not the end of the story. And she knew that. That it's more important that our own houses are built on solid ground before we go out and help try to build somebody else's house. This is so important, my friends. And I don't think we actually grasp it sometimes. So why do we actually have to make this also important? Not just for us, but think about ministry itself. Like, does anybody in here want to be a fruitful person in their work and in their vocation? Do you want people to go to heaven? We talked about this in my last session, right? I threw some hand grenades into the room, didn't I? Is anybody convicted about that when I threw those hand grenades into the room? Okay. So you want people to go to heaven, don't you? I do. I want you to go to heaven. So I'm not going to avoid the hard truths. I am what you, this is how I try to describe how I present and talk and write and do things, how I coach leaders and do other stuff. I want to be charitably provocative. Provocative because I think people need to be stirred up. Charitable in the sense of, I don't need to do it for the sake of just being provocative. I need to do it for the sake of trying to love you enough to move you off of the place where you are right now because God is not a God of static status quo. He is a God of movement into greater. God is not okay with you being okay. You know that old book in the 70s? It's okay. being I'm okay. You're okay. That's actually a lie. It's not okay just being okay. You aren't made to be okay. You are made to be a saint. You are made to be great. You are made to be holy. You are made to be a great evangelist. You are made to be amazing and to honor God and to give him glory by your very life. And that happens by our interior life. So why do we pray also? And Paul says this in Ephesians 6, 19. Speech may be given to me to open my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. He wants people to pray for him so that can happen. Why? Because my proclamation has no power to change your heart in and of itself. What changes hearts? I should say better, who changes hearts? Yeah, it's, it's God. Everybody get that? Everybody just, I mean, you're all like, duh, bald man. I'm like, yeah, but we need to make sure we all have. God changes hearts. Can I change anybody else's heart? Do I have? Yes, I can. I can actually change my own heart by saying yes to what God wants to do because God's already given me the grace. Okay, so the answer is yes, but only me. And I can't change past me. And I can't change future me right now, but I can change me right now. I can say yes right now. That's all we have. This is why the scriptures say, today is the day of salvation. Today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. Today. Friends, God wants today to have every single part of you. And if you can't give him everything, give him what you can. Give him what you can. Because if you want to be good at your jobs good at being a catechist, good at whatever you do in ministry, whether that's on the, on the clock or not, you got to pray. And this is what he says. That's where the power happens. I've literally seen this happen at Bosco. Now, my next session tomorrow morning, I'm going to pre, I'm going to, I'm going to give away a lot here. Okay. I'm going to train people on how to evangelize and we're going to do very, very practical, hands-on stuff. I will not finish that session by any stretch of the imagination, okay? Because I get into a lot of stuff, and we're going to get rolling. But one of the things I will not fail to do is I'm going to preach the gospel in a compelling way and invite a response in prayer that somebody can respond in faith. What does that sound like to some of you? Describe it. Does it sound like a Baptist preacher or a Protestant? It shouldn't. Because Paul just said, he wants people to pray so that speech may be given to me to open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. And he goes on to say, so that those respond in faith. When the jailer, when Paul and Silas are miraculously freed from jail, and the jailer's about to kill himself, he said, don't kill himself, we're still here. What ends up happening, he says, oh my goodness, what must I do to be saved? And what does Paul respond? There are three things he has to do. 
Repent, believe, and be baptized. Repent, believe, and be baptized. There are three things he has to do. If Paul didn't answer that question, that would have been a very modern Catholic response. <laughs> what do I need to be saved? Well, have you filled out your forms for RCIA? I think you probably ought to go talk to Father up at the parish. Friends, we have to have an answer for that. And that answer, and the boldness to answer it, born out of prayer and the power. Because why, Francis says, without prayer, all our activity risks being fruitless and our message empty. Jesus wants evangelizers to proclaim the good news not only with words, but by a life transfigured by God's presence. Prayer starts with our own transformation so we have the power to be transformative agents in the lives of others. Prayer transforms our own lives so that we can be transformative agents in the lives of others. That's not, that's not like it's you know, rocket science hard, but it's, it's hard to actually live out. So he goes on to say, without prolonged moments of adoration, prayerful encounter with the word, a sincere conversation with the Lord. Notice different ways of praying here. And let me stop real quick and say this. And I need to call this out from our, Catholic, our, our modern Catholic culture. I'm about to throw like 15 hand grenades into the room. Bodies are about to hit the walls, okay? I am sick and tired of the different camps in the Catholic Church saying my way of praying, my way of worshiping, our way of doing this is the way to save the church. That is crap. If the church says it is okay to do X, it is okay to do X, and you don't have to do X if it's optional, but you better not be tearing down somebody else who does X if it's part of the church's tradition. Stop it. Just cut it out. Stop it. That bickering and infighting is of the enemy, not of God. God wants unity. He called the church Catholic and universal for a reason, and there are different times and places and devotions and ways of praying, and they're all okay if they're sanctioned by the church. And if you don't want, if you want to argue this, I will argue over a bottle of bourbon tonight till the, till the cows come home, okay? That's something we say in Texas, okay? Because we let the cows out to pasture. I got cattle people in my family. Anyway, so the point being is this. Stop it. How you pray and want to pray, as long as the church is okay with it, it's okay. Now, there are some things like, you know, some Eastern Buddhist stuff. No, we can't accept that. Get it out, right? That's not acceptable. But I don't care if you pray in Latin, Aramaic, or anything else. I don't care if you pray in English or Spanish. I don't care. I don't care if you pray the rosary or something else. And don't go telling other people they have to. By the way, as a minister of the church... As a catechist in the church, as a young, young adult minister in the church, you have no right to force your own personal pious practices on anybody else. Oh, it worked for me, therefore it has to work for everybody else. I hear this all the time. Now, sometimes it's born out of a sincere desire to share something good with others. And I'll give you an example. Somebody goes to a retreat. They have a conversion or a reconversion or a deeper conversion. They have an experience or an encounter with God in his presence. And they come back and they tell everybody about it. You have to go, you have to go, you have to go. Right? That's, that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, look, I pray the rosary every single day. I have a Marian devotion. I'm consecrated to my mother Mary. I cannot tell somebody else everybody has to be consecrated to Mary. That's not appropriate. What are some universal ways of praying that apply to every single Catholic? There's only a few. Anybody want to name them? The Mass. Okay, speak a little broadly there. What's more broad than just the Mass? Sacraments and liturgy. Sacraments in particular. Okay, because even the Liturgy of the Hours, is, it's, it's encouraged for lay people, but not required, right? So you can't even say the Liturgy of the Hours except for religious and clergy, is it required? Everybody got that? What's another one that is for everyone? The rosary is not for everyone. The rosary is encouraged, and it is a valuable thing, but it is not a universal. And I, there is a, I said that one time at a Bosco about five years ago, and I left here, and the person who worked in the diocesan position wanted to argue with me, and I gave him all the relevant stuff. And you will look in the magisterial text of the church. It's encouraging. It is not universal. It will say all people should consider and things like that, but it doesn't say all people should. There's a difference in the language here, and we have to be appropriately 
relevant there. Anybody else want to try? Yes, ma'am. Scripture, that's it. Sacraments and Scripture. We're done. List is over. Your list is done. Everything else is up for grabs when it comes to prayer. So when you're teaching prayer, let's make sure we're starting with Scripture and the sacraments. Okay? Because those are the foundational. Everybody is called to do those. Now, then we have things that are encouraged by the church for everybody. Things like Liturgy of the Hours, Devotion to Mary in the, in the Rosary, etc. You know, you get it, right? Lexio Divina using Scripture, which Scripture is just, we have to have some kind of Scripture, right? Not everybody's called to do Lexio, right? Anyway, anybody want, I'm going to stop. Anybody got a question or pushback? I'm okay with you saying, I disagree with you, bald men, and I want to fight. By the way, I'm giving you my weakness. I've had way too many concussions in my life, stupid football in Texas, you know. So all you got to do is connect with my head, I'm done, okay? You win. Anybody, want, anybody got a question? Comment. Yes, ma'am. It's an opinion. You can, you can, you can call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Here's what I'm saying, though. Okay, there's a distinction that's being made. Everybody, hopefully, has an experience of understanding this. Marian devotion is a good upheld by the church as a good that everybody is called to experience and try. But not everybody is called to do it right now. Does that, does that help any... And the reason why I say that is because Marian devotion is a part of the church's tradition. Okay, I want you to I want you to put yourself. How many of you guys work or have worked with OCIA? Okay, you ever okay? You ever run up against like a a really strong Protestant that's coming into the church and they're they're big things probably praying to saints or Mary. Anybody anybody done that? And they kind of get devotion to saints and they've tried it on for size, but there's just something in the back of their hearts and their minds, it's kind of like, oh, I can't really do it, you know? Okay, we have to be real patient with somebody like that to say, because I've heard people say things like, you're not a good Catholic until you pray the rosary every day. That's what I'm warning against, okay? Does that make sense? You cannot say stuff like that. And you cannot be so pushy or universal, and that Catholic who just became Catholic may not be ready for a daily rosary, okay? You, you have to be patient and kind in order to understand that person who we're trying to catechize, lead, evangelize, wherever they need to go, we're going to meet them right there and say, I understand you struggle with this. All I ask as somebody, as a friend, is that you try to remain open to this possibility as something that you could grow into at a later time, right? So that's where we're going with these, these kind of statements. Now, while doing that, let's help you with your sacramental life and let's help you with your, your prayer life with Scripture, right? Because those are universals. Or if they have another devotion that they, maybe, maybe it's some other, like mental prayer in another context that they have taken on and it's working for them, right? So we help, let's further that, and maybe that's the road that God's going to lead to, okay, boom. And, and I'll give you a personal story. Like, my wife is that person. She came from a Lutheran tradition had a lot of that, those issues and baggage, and it took her years and years and years before she developed a relationship with our Blessed Mother, and now she's got a great love of Mary, right? But again, my point being is, when I say universal, I mean now and always for everyone, okay? Maybe that distinction will help everybody. All right. So, the U.S. bishops wrote this. Without prayer, the good news of Jesus Christ cannot be understood, spread, or accepted. <clears throat> Without prayer. Now, most people don't have a problem necessarily with spread or accepted. It's this word right here that bothers people. Without prayer, the good news of Jesus cannot be understood. What do we normally think when we think of understanding the gospel, understanding the doctrines of the church, understanding Jesus Christ? What do we think of? Just an act of what? Yeah, it's like it's a study or an intellectual exercise, right? But here's the problem. You cannot divorce good theology from good prayer. 
And if you do, what you've done is you've made a mockery of what the theology is all about. The truths are so that you can fall deeper in love with God and his church. The truths exist so that you can fall deeper in love with God and his church. This is why the little old lady who's never studied theology but has a deep interior life is at a better place than the theologian who knows all the truths but doesn't pray much and pleases God more. Now, should the two go hand in hand, growth in our understanding so that we have the capability of loving God more? Absolutely. We want to have both. But if you had to pick one, always pick the side of the spiritual life. Now, I'm going to tell you, in the United States, in Canada, in the West, we have very much made Catholicism about learning and intellectual life, and we're very good at it. We have done it, and in our structures and institutions, this is how we operate. So this is one of the things that when I coach Catholic leaders, I'm going to tell you, it's one of the harder things to do. I could sit down and tell you all the stuff that they need to know. But then I say, let's stop and pray. And they're like, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with you. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, meeting's over. They don't actually want to do deep, intensive group prayer together. And if there's one thing I have found about institutions, if I ask, I'm like, okay, so do you guys pray together? So let me ask you guys, as Catholic leaders, in some context, on your teams, whether that's I work for a diocese, but I'm all alone over here in this campus, or whether that's I have a group of, you know, 120 people at the diocesan staff or whatever it might be, or I'm a young adult volunteer over here, but I've got a team of four other people that help me coordinate. Whatever that is, do you pray together? Like really, truly, intensely, often pray together? If so, please tell me. I'd like to know, do you guys do that? Okay, tell me about that. How do you pray? So you all go together to this other church? Yeah. Where, what, where are you working, by the way, can I ask? Okay, so it is a diocese. Okay, so a diocesan office and you're going. Okay, go ahead. So I'm going to your diocese and talking to these people. Is that right? Yes, okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> So, well, I, I'm glad we got the contract signed before he came to this session. But anyway, no, so that's great. Okay, what do you think you're missing right now? Okay. Do you guys do anything on a daily level at all? Like anything short or anything? No. Okay. That might be where I would encourage you, just FYI. Okay, so a couple, those two things, if that's where you feel. But only if God calls you to it, right? It's a discernment. So first of all, good job. I think that's above the pay grade, but don't, don't settle. Okay, don't settle. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Anybody else, well, first of all, before I talk, anybody else want to share, like maybe even a struggle? Yes, ma'am. I think there's a generational struggle as well. I work in the Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, here's, here's where I'm, I didn't intend to go this direction, but we're going to go this direction for a second. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, if you're a non-decision maker in your context, in the sense of you have bosses who have bosses, who, could, who are the ones who would make a decision about whether the team prays together or not, raise your hand for me. Okay? Okay, if you're the boss 
uh, who can make that kind of decision, raise your hand for me. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. If you are the boss who can make a decision, this is how our team wants to pray, I want you to listen for a second to those people who are not the decision makers. Okay, if you're not a decision maker, do you desire to pray with other people in your, in your work, in your team? Tell me about that a little bit. Tell me why. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anybody else with team context? Thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. I think that uh, for me, is I, I work for a Catholic school, and we don't, as teachers, pray together. Mm. That kind of brings us into unity with not only God, but with each other. Mm -hmm. That's actually the vast, vast, vast majority of Catholic schools. You're not any different than that. So let me ask you guys, you're not the decision maker, but what could you do in this context? What could you do to impact that reality? Okay, what else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's what you have power in the, to do. You, you can't mandate, you can't order, but you can invite. And in fact, if you're a leader, that's actually where I would start too. I wouldn't mandate prayer. I would invite to prayer. I'd invite to maybe a daily midday prayer. We did that at a parish I worked at where we would gather everybody who was there because, you know, sometimes people weren't there. They had appointments or something else that called them. And everybody would we'd gather at noon. We'd ring a bell up the staff hallway and Nell would ring the bell, and I would, I'd sing Nell's bells, like to ACDC. <laughs> Nell's bells, shh, shh, set the tone real good. So anyway, <clears throat> and we walk, <clears throat> it's better than Hell's bells, right? So we'd, we'd all go up there and pray. It was simple, but it actually changed the culture of our, our parish. A little simple daily prayer changed the culture of our parish. Um, from that, it grew into um, the pastor saying, uh, We've talked about this, and Marcel and I are going to spend a half an hour a day, every single day we, we decided to do this, in prayer, in adoration, in our own quiet time. And we invite all of you to do this as well. At least half an hour, you can go to an hour, and you will be paid for this. And we want this to be part of your job. So that, now we would prefer that you do it right before you start your work, so that you're setting the work up for success with the prayer. But if you can't, then do it at some point during the day. Okay, and then from there it grew into, you know, further, you know, reflections and days of retreat and all kinds of other stuff. And literally what ended up happening was, you know, those compartmentalizations and silos that happen at a lot of institutions, they started to crumble. And our fruitfulness started to increase and things started to change. That wasn't hard, but what ended up happening was we invited that power of the Holy Spirit, that same one you got and the same one that came at Pentecost to come into our staff and change things. And it started with some invitations. Why? Because without prayer, the good news of Jesus Christ cannot be understood, spread, or accepted. Now, this is what some of the saints say about prayer. You guys know the power of prayer. And if you don't know the power of prayer, you haven't prayed enough. Okay? Did anybody have a great experience at adoration last night? I did. It was beautiful. I love adoration like that. Did anybody have a great time at Mass when you got to Mass this morning or something else? I did. I love celebrating 
the sacrament of the, the Eucharist. And oh my gosh, I mean, this is Jesus, truly, substantially, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And he died on a cross so that I could receive him in my body. Shut your mouth. I mean, come on. And he did that for you and for everybody else. And see, that's where our power derives to go out and, and change lives, to be the instrument of, of salvation for others. And this is what, like St. John Vianney here, what souls we can convert by our prayers. The one who saves a soul from hell saves his, this soul and his own as well. Without prayer, San Alphonse says, we have neither light nor strength to advance the way which leads. This is, this is it right here, folks. And the catechism says this. Christian prayer is a covenant relationship between God and man in Christ. It is the action of God and of man. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I pray and I'm like, God, do something. This, is, this has actually been one of my big prayers lately. Um, and it's a pretty bold prayer. Okay, so I run an apostolate, Catholic missionary disciples, and we're growing and we've got great stuff going on. And I, I told God recently, though, I'm already super busy and I'm, I, but I told God in my prayer, God, if you want this thing to absolutely explode for the glory of your kingdom, make it happen, but only if you increase and I decrease. That's been my prayer, okay? I don't need to be the big sage on the stage who has, you know, 5,000 people in a room or anything like that. I don't need to be the face on the video screen or anything like that. I want to go deeply invest in people's lives and go change things in the church so that more people come to Jesus Christ. And so if I have to, go, like into nothingness, fine. If he wants to burn me up, fine. If I have to suffer, well, maybe fine. Um, <laughs> I like my comfort. I told you that last time. So, but when I do suffer and I can't do anything about it, we're going to offer that back, right? So all these things, yeah, that's part of it. But it's got to start, I can't have that kind of prayer until I trust a God who's got my, my best intentions in mind. That comes from prayer. And I got to tell you, sometimes I truly trust God, and sometimes I grasp at my control myself. Sometimes I'm, I'm, you know, have consolation. Sometimes I have desolation. Sometimes I'm really into my prayer, and sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it's a chore, and sometimes it's not. And what I want to do is I want to encourage you right now in your prayer. Wherever you are right now in your prayer life, whether it's non-existent or whether it's awesome, I want to encourage you. God's not displeased with you because of the state of your prayer life, nor is he going to say, oh my gosh, you're my best disciple because you have a good prayer life right now, because he could take it right back away, right? His presence. So let's be okay with where we are in the sense of this is where my starting point is, but let's not be okay with this is my end point. It's time to go somewhere else. Why? Because you can't be a saint without it. Why? Because God wants more. He wants all of it. And it's his initiative. Holiness is a gift. Holiness is not just me pulling myself up by my bootstraps and do, like, grunting my way through prayer and doing all these devotions and, and choosing what's right and going into confession more often. Yeah, those are good choices. But it's actually saying, God, I can't change everything about my life and my heart and my I can't, I can't transform myself by my own power. It takes an act of God to transform a heart. So God, come and do it again or do it for the first time. I don't know how many of you have ever had a conversion, but conversion is what God wants again. And why is this? Because it changes the world. This is what Benedict says. Our first duty, therefore, precisely in order to heal this world is to be holy. Oh, my gosh. See, what do we do when we stop and we think about the culture? I want you to think about all the crap that is in our culture right now. Like the utter ridiculousness. Like the tearing down of the human person. The, the misdefinition and redefinition of marriage and sexuality and goodness and truth and beauty of religion and faith. Of all these things. And we could bicker and argue and get all, you know, rah, rah, rah. And I could do this too. I, I actually have a, a terrible charism of being able to understand because of that, that I have a leadership charism too. And sometimes my leadership is actually I get to see all the pro problems and in institutions and plans and stuff like that. So I get all negative. I can tear down all this stuff. And I can tell you all the problems in the world. That doesn't fix anything, does it? 
No, I, it, but me being a saint does. Think about the great saints. Okay, let's talk about St. Francis de Sales, who is one of my faves. Oh, my gosh. This dude. I mean, God. Okay, so St. Francis de Sales was neither smart, neither was he super energetic, nor was he the greatest pastor in the world. What he had was perseverance, endurance, and patience. And he had great, great faith. And so he sent into the French mountains that border Switzerland and into the area of Geneva, which is now part of Switzerland, right? But it was France. So he sent out here. And this is right after the Protestant Reformation. And there were 60,000 people in the area who were former Catholics. Okay, 60,000. So think of a town of about 60,000 people, and they're all former Catholics who have become Reformed Protestants. And he's sent into these mountains, and the bishop says, go evangelize them. <laughs> right after the Protestant Reformation. I mean, people are being killed at this time for being Catholic in Protestant places, and Protestants are being killed in Catholic places. It's just awful, right? And so he sent out to, this, to these people, and here comes St. Francis de Sales into this place, and he starts trying to knock on doors. And so he has the door slammed in his face, and they pass a law that says you can't knock on doors anymore. So he starts preaching in public spaces. And he shouted down, but he keeps doing it. And so they pass a law that says you can't preach in public places. So he starts printing out and writing out little pamphlets and handing them out and then talking to people instead of preaching and continuing to do his mission. And he, he, did, he almost died of being exposed in cold weather and a starvation. He got caught in a mountain pass one time and got frostbite. I mean, this guy suffered a lot. And for years and years and years, he did this. Flash forward, at the end of his mission, before he's called back from the mountains, 40,000 of the 60,000 people became Catholic. And it all flowed out of his spiritual life because he didn't depend upon his own strength, his own worthiness, he depended upon a God who worked through him to transform those lives. And here's what I need, to, I need you to know. There are people in your life right now who need you to be a saint like St. Francis de Sales. They need you to be persevere in a culture that wants to tear you down. They need you to pray when prayer is hard. They need you to witness to them even when sometimes you're rejected and have doors slammed. They need you to suffer and offer it back up to the Lord so that he can make that suffering something usable in other people's lives. And they need you primarily to say yes to God today. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray. Right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for you. In a little bit, we're going to have some different kinds of prayer, but right now we're going to pray for you. Okay? So I'm going to intercede. This is another charism. I have a charism of intercession. And it's crazy because I will text people and be like, hey, do you need prayers today? And like, yes, I'm in the hospital right now. Five minutes in, in, in the future, I'm going to be in surgery. Pray for me. It's creepy, okay? So I want to pray for you. But the, what, what I want you to do is I want you to stop and place yourself in the presence of God. So I'm going to guide you through this, okay? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So close your eyes, okay? Be okay with closing your eyes. It's okay to close them. God, we believe you're present here. Or two or more are gathered in your name. You say you're in our midst. Right now, your spirit is here. Let us acknowledge that God is here. Give God permission to move in your life. If you want to pray this prayer, you can repeat it after me. If not, you can make your own. Holy Spirit, come. Heavenly Father, I open my heart to you. And I ask you to come and fill me with your grace once again. Jesus, take me by the hand. Show me the face of the Father the one who longs for me personally, who sent you for me. 
Holy Trinity, I place yourself, place myself at your, at your desire and need for this world as a servant who will do what you ask. And so I'm going to pray for you people. Lord, I pray for your people, your church, who are gathered in your name in this room. I pray that you might bless them. Give them an anointing of your Holy Spirit. Give them what they need right now, whether it be healing, a deeper understanding of their identity, greater faith, hope, or love, the virtue of endurance, of perseverance, of boldness, of courage. Give them, Lord, chastity, humility. Grant unto them whatever they need in order to be a saint. May your church rise up. May we have a longing for the salvation of others. May we see others with your eyes. May we love people with your heart. Give us a taste of what it means to love this world and those in it, despite the flaws and the sins and the errors of our culture. Help us to love the people who are difficult for us to love. I pray for their families and their friends, their communities and their co-workers. I pray for their ministry, that as saints, Lord, they might make a deep impact because the grace that you work in the lives around them through them. May they be instruments who are powerful in your hand. Jesus, we beg of you these things. But primarily, we ask you to help us to desire holiness, to grow in holiness, to glorify your name, to grow your kingdom. And that souls might go to heaven because we said yes to you again and again and again. So tell Jesus yes like right now in your heart. Just tell him yes. Give him room. Give him permission. Jesus, I give you everything. Jesus, I give you my sin. Jesus, I give you my wounds. Jesus, I give you my problems. Jesus, I give you my desires, the good and bad. Jesus, I give you my future. Jesus, I give you my past. Jesus, I give you my, t- my gifts and talents. Jesus, I give you my mind and my heart. Jesus, I give you my body. Jesus, I give you my soul. Jesus, I give you permission to transform me again. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why do we do this? Your holiness changes others. Pope Paul VI, our evangelizing zeal must spring from true holiness of life. Without this mark of holiness, our word will have no difficulty will have difficulty in touching the heart of modern man. It risks being vain and sterile. Now, have you ever known somebody who was either teaching, preaching, or guiding something in the Catholic Church who you knew didn't believe what they were saying? Did You're kind of looking like, yeah, if only, you know, doctor, take your own medicine, right? Doctor, take your own medicine. I've had that experience. This is what Pope Paul VI is talking about. It's not just the teaching and preaching. It's also the ministering. It's the entering into life. If I get up here and I say, okay, you need to pray more, and I, and I don't take my own medicine, I'm a hypocrite, okay? So I, again, I'm preaching to myself here some. The fact is, though, without us doing this, we become the hypocrites that have vain and sterile ability to be able to evangelize. So the real question for us is then this. Do you actually want to be a saint? Is anybody in here kind of mixed up on this? Like a yes and no. Or maybe yes, sometimes, no, other times, maybe other times. Come on, be honest. I am. This is me. Do I want to be a saint? Oh, heck yeah. Depending on what day it is. (laughs) Oh, heck no, on another day. You know, like one of those days you, you, you face your, your crap or your sin or whatever, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so limited. I'm so bad. You know, I was a jerk to my wife, you know, other stuff. Like, I'm being impatient today. I'm just grouchy because I haven't had enough coffee, and I slept in a bed that did not. Oh, my gosh, that best Western. Oh. 
the end, my, yeah. But do you really want to? Okay, God, sometimes our prayer needs to be, God, I kind of want to be a saint. He doesn't need like some humongous prayer of, Lord, transform me to be the bestest ever so that I can be, you know. No, he, what he needs is, okay, a little bit. And if all you got's a little bit, guess what? He can crack the door. I mean, I want, think about the fact that Peter was such a knucklehead. Have you ever thought about like Peter, the knucklehead pope? I mean, that's, he should be like patron saint of bald guys and knuckleheads, because I really identify with this dude. Because if you think about it, he's, I mean, good gracious. Here he comes, you know, his brother Andrew, first of all, brings him, like little brother, brings him to Jesus, and he's kind of like, meh, you know. And then he comes back, and he's like, come follow him, and he drops his nets, and he goes and follows him, not knowing what it's going to bring. But then 50%, okay, this is a true statistic, 50% of the time Peter opens his mouth in the gospel, he makes a mistake or says something dumb. That's the kind of saint I can relate to, okay? I can relate to that guy. And not only that, but he denied him three times, and yet he was called back to repentance. And this is the guy Jesus is like hooking the wagon of the future of the world to? Okay, doesn't that give you a little bit of hope? It's possible, my friends. Think of the lives of the saints. These people were, I mean, St. Augustine, you can name them, all these people, they're just they're just people, sinners like you and me, who God's come and rescued. And the reason God does that with those kind of people is so that you and I can identify with them, those ordinary people, the people who may not be super attractive before they had this change of heart. And, you know, like physically, like Mother Teresa was not the most beautiful woman. And yet, if you see her, like, aren't you attracted to her? I mean, come on, objectively speaking, she was not like, uh, she's not going to be a model, you know? That's true, but it's, she might be one of the most beautiful souls of the 20th century, and everybody's like, I want to be close to her, because holiness is attractive, because holiness changes things, because holiness fulfills the mission of the church. JP2, the church's missionary spirituality is a journey towards holiness. Paul talks about it with Timothy. It's not according to our works, but according to his own design and the grace bestowed on us. God planned for you to be a saint and nothing less. And if that, what's the greatest regret of all life is to live it and not become a saint? Who was that? Was that Bloy that said that? So part of this, though, has to be done in relationship. You cannot be a saint with just you and God. And this is part of, we talked about this in the last session, but part of this has to be done in community. And I think one of the biggest things, successes that the devil has had is in breaking up the fact that there is very little real friendship and community being lived out in our Catholic context in the 20th and 21st century, late 20th and 21st century. Like my mom and dad grew up in South Louisiana, okay, when pretty much everybody was Catholic and everybody went to church in small towns where everybody knew each other. Community was the small town and the parish. They had it. And so by the time all their kids were born in the 60s and 70s, guess what had happened? All those parishes were basically going under. People were moving away. There wasn't the community of the small towns anymore. And they didn't have a way to build community outside of that context. And this happened across the West with the breakdown of the family, the movement of peoples, with the rising incomes, the changing of jobs, all of these things that happened, we have the breakdown of societal norms of having community based in deep roots of generation upon generation in one town and doing these things in the small parishes. So we get to today where we have things like mega parishes or consolidated parishes of a bunch of people who don't really know each other and people who don't have friendships. And yet, if you want to be a saint and you can't do it alone, how do we break that? Well, we can't do it alone. And I'm going to tell you right now, it takes you saying to somebody else who you trust and love, I want to be a saint and I can't do it alone and I need you to help me. It's actually being bold enough to be able to. But now, that doesn't happen by you saying, hey, we just met. You want to go to lunch? And then saying, hey, I want to be a saint and I want you to help me do it. 
that's not where you start. But you build a friendship to the point where you have enough trust and intimacy and all the other things that are necessary, the vulnerability that takes to get to intimacy, and then you start to say these kind of bold things. I have told my friends, not just my spiritual director, I have told my friends I want to be a saint, and I can't do it without you helping me and holding me accountable. This is St. Paul telling St. Peter, you're doing one thing and saying another, right? Because what was he doing? He's saying, you're free to go eat anything you want, and yet Peter was abstaining because Peter was being a hypocrite, right? Good for you, not for me, or good for me, not for you. Look, we got we to gotta do this, and it takes other people to pour into us, to pray with us, to do these things. And if you don't have that right now, I know it's difficult to get there, but it's worth the time, the effort, and all of the things that it takes to get there. And you might flop and flail with the first couple of folks you even try it with. But if I pick up the phone right now and say, Keith, I need you to pray with me right now for this intention. Keith will drop whatever he wants or whatever he's doing as long as it's not like some intense emergency with his family and he'll pray with me. And I can do that with Trey and I can do that with Gerald and I can do that with Kurt and I can do that with Josh and I can do that with all these guys that I've invested in because they've invested in me. I can do that with Father Brian. I can do that with other people because we're investing in each other. And by the way, I do that with clergy. And I've got some friends who literally live at, well, not literally live. They hang out at my house all the time. Why? Because we pray together. We talk about stuff. We do life together. And when I say do life together, we go on vacations together. We go on road trips together. We sit in my backyard around the fire pit together. We pray together. We study scriptures together. That's doing life together. And I can't be a saint without having that. Neither can you. And it's hard work because relationships are difficult. But this is how Jesus did it. He didn't say, come follow me. Here's the video program. Here's your online resource. Come follow me. Be my dis or, and he didn't say, go and make disciples of all nations by holding a big conference. What did he say? Go and make disciples. And how did they do it? They went into a town. They planted their roots. They preached the gospel. They made converts. And then they discipled them. And when they discipled them, they entered into life with them. Okay, we're going to get into that and in how to evangelize and how to practically do it in my next session tomorrow morning. But the fact of the matter is, you have to have these relationships with God, with yourself, with others and with the church. And when I, the one that people are kind of like, man, what are you talking about yourself? It's who you're supposed to be and who you are currently. That's what I'm talking about. Who you are currently may not be who you're called to be. Who you're called to be is you in the eyes of God perfected. You in heaven. Okay? God sees all of that. He knows all of that. He knows your potential, and he wants to tap into it because he put it in you, and he knows there's more to get out of you. And our, you know what the biggest problem with us being saints? Us. I'm going to say that again. It's not the world. It's not your spouse. It's not your congregation. It's not the people who don't like you. It's not the culture that's against you. It's not the infighting within the church. It's you. When G.K. Chesterton wrote that, you know, that one sentence response to the question, what's wrong with the world? You know what he said? I am. I'm wrong with the world. So let's acknowledge that. I got room to grow here. So what's our proper response? Conversion. And that starts with the initial conversion. Now, I'm going, I don't have time today in this space to do this, but I will tomorrow morning. But I'm going to tell you this. If you do, have never had a conversion to Jesus Christ and you want to have one, I'm going to say this again. If you've never had a conversion to Jesus Christ where you've made an intentional act of faith to say, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ and I want to follow him. Okay. Now that could be over years. That, that, that's not just always a one and done thing. It could be a long process, right? Okay. It could be a lifelong process for some people. But if you never had that and you want it, please come see me afterward because I can help guide you into how to respond in faith. It's as simple as a little prayer that says, I believe and I want this, similar to what we just did a minute ago, okay? 
That's the first one. And then it's from sin to life, from self to God. But this one of constant conversion. What is a life of constant conversion? When you hear the phrase constant conversion, what do you think? Anybody want to offer a thought? What do you think? Constant conversion. Yes, sir. Okay. Tell me what it would, might look like. He said constantly evolving or changing. What would that look like for somebody who wants to be holy? Okay, so an understanding. What else would that be look like? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, constantly choosing God. Okay, so what's the first thing that has to happen for conversion to happen? What, who, who acts first? I should say it like that. That's an easy question. Who acts first? God. Okay, who acts second? Us. Okay, can conversion act without both of those? Can conversion happen without both of those things happening? No. Okay, so do we believe God acts every time we receive the sacraments? We had this question last time, right? So, yes. So, now what is God waiting on? Us. Here's where it gets tricky in prayer. Have you ever asked God to move or to act or to do? Do you believe God has already moved, he's already acted, and he's already done? Would you say he's already moved and acted and done? He has, hasn't he? Okay, so let's stop and here's a truth that sometimes we need to be reminded of. God's grace is in you. God wants to change you. God's waiting on you way more than you're waiting on him. God's waiting on you way more. And he's way more patient. He's way more kind and tender. And all he wants is right now for you to say yes. That's all. That's all he wants, okay? So the proper disposition is this one of humility. That's the yes. Okay, so remember, humility is a right understanding of who God is and who I am in relation to God. It is not, I'm so lowly and bad, or I'm not so great. You know, it's, it's the in-between. I have, I'm kind of a mixed up jumble of all this stuff. I got problems and sins, but I've also got gifts, and, and God's done great things in me, and I'm a child of God. It's a right understanding. It's not supposed to be depressive. Humility is not supposed to be depressive. I can humbly say, I have gifts. You can humbly say, I am talented. I, you can humbly say, I'm good at this, or whatever it might be. As long as it's not for the point of pointing just to me, but saying, look at what God has done. So when I say something like, I've got a charism of intercession, that is a point of me, because believe me, God's proven again and again through my intercession, it's not my power. It's the Holy Spirit. Because when I text somebody thinking, huh, I wonder what, you know, Joe's doing right now. Joe, you need anything for me to pray? And Joe's like, yeah, I just tripped and fell and I had a concussion. And I'm sitting in the hospital right now in intensive care. Holy crap, Joe, I'm coming up there, you know. And I, that's not me. God just acted. So this humility is the virtue without, it's impossible to receive God's other gifts. And I think this is what happens is sometimes we say, well, I'm not good enough or I'm too good enough. That's where pride is. Pride's either I'm too good enough, and sometimes this is the easy pride that we sometimes define pride by, right? I'm so good, I don't need God. But it's also, pride can also be I'm so lowly, God would never love me. This is pride too. And this in my, my estimation is actually a more dangerous pride in some ways. Because this is the one where you say never God. Because this person's easier because at some point they're going to probably be humbled in the sense of moving away from oh, something's bad, I need God, right? It's not going my way all the time. This person over here, you can just get worse and worse and worse, right? You know, I think of like this person right here is when I think about, I think about my sister who was nearly bled out when she had internal bleeding and they had to put something like eight quarts of blood into her over the course of like a day. Um, and she was diagnosed with cancer in every feminine sexual organ that she had. And it was cervical cancer is what she had. And they took everything out of her. And for five years, she suffered intense radiation and chemotherapy to the point where um, her colon had become what the doctor called cement. 
And so they had to remove most of her colon. They had to remove all kinds of other things internally. She lost everything like Job. She lost her job. She lost her freedom. She had to move in with my parents. She lost money. She had none, and she was destitute. Um, she lost friends because people said they didn't want to be around her because it was just too much for them to handle. Some of my family walked away and wouldn't, didn't want anything to do with her. And she suffered pain, just like intense suffering I can't imagine. And days where she would just literally roll around in bed in agony because they couldn't do anything for her. And she had that for five years before she died. And on her most honest days of prayer, like when she was just truly being honest, she'd say things like, where are you, God? Why won't you come change this, God? Why won't you come cast this out, God? Don't you love me, God? My sister has had all her questions answered. That intense, terrible suffering was not wasted. My sister was a great disciple. She worked in youth ministry for many years. Uh, a hero of mine. She's, she's like 12 years older than I am. Uh, and my sister, Simone, in that suffering, helped me to understand what it meant to carry the cross. And I asked her, I said, look, this could be redemptive suffering for our siblings who don't go to church and don't believe right now. Would you off, start offering that suffering for our siblings? Out of the three siblings we have, one of them has returned to the church and to the sacraments and is a believer. Another one is on the journey home, and another one needs a lot more prayer. But I believe my brother, who has come back to the church, came back directly because of what Simon did for him. And it took sainthood of my sister to save my brother. It took hell for my sister so my brother could go to heaven. That's never easy, friends. That's, that doesn't make her cross any lighter. Those answers, where are you, God? I was right there, Simone, holding you in the palm of my hand. Why won't you make it stop? Because I got a bigger plan. Don't you love me? Of course I love you. I love you so much. I want to take away all the other stuff so that I'm the only thing left for you. When is it going to stop? It's done now, my daughter. That's prayer. That's humility. That's the disposition God wants. He doesn't want any fake you when you go to prayer. And sometimes you just need to let him know it, right? And be okay with the fact that he's not going to be angry with you because of your struggle in your prayer or your problems in your prayer. So your prayer life, why do we let it slip? It's because of these things. We get discouraged because, oh, God isn't answering my prayer. He's not answering in the way I want or at the timeline I want. We doubt because we don't have a strong faith. We get impatient or we convince ourselves that it isn't God's will to pray for this thing. We give in to temptations that lead us away from prayer. I'm going to tell you about another prayer experience for myself. I, I had reached what you could possibly call the greatest layperson job in campus ministry in the world. I was running the day-to-day -day operations of the largest campus ministry in the world at Texas A&M, St. Mary's, which literally is known in Rome, which we put out, you know, a dozen vocations every year. We got 4,500 kids that go to Mass, and we're opening the $31 million church. And I had reached, like... We, and, and the apex of St. Mary's ministry was when I was running it, okay? And I'm like, oh, look at me, you know, I'm doing this. My boss is now Bishop of Tulsa. The guy who was my boss for 10 of the 11 years is Bishop of Tulsa. His predecessor is Bishop of St. Angelo. You know, all that stuff, right? So here I am at this, this height of this lay stuff, and I thought I'd retire, run in St. Mary's, walk off into the sunset, be like, yo, God, <laughs> you know? Rainbows and unicorns and glitter, and everything's going to be great. Because I'm so great. And I asked God a stupid prayer. You ever had a stupid prayer with God? How about this one? Try this one on. If you don't know a stupid prayer, I'll, this is a beginner level stupid prayer. And then there's like advanced level stupid prayer. I, I was doing advanced level. This is a beginner level. God, give me patience. That's beginner level stupid prayer. Why is that stupid? 
Because he's going to give you the opportunity to practice. He's not just going to magically like, bring, now you're patient. He's like, hey, get stuck in traffic. By the way, your kid just left every toilet paper uh, place empty in the entire house and you're on the toilet. Okay, that's like, <laughs> okay, this is, this is your opportunity for patience with your kid. Those kind of things, right? Okay, advanced level, you want to go above this, is pray something like this. Hey, God, maybe, you know, just maybe, you know, like if you didn't want me to have this job, would you make me know that? Yeah, and he did. And he's like, oh, clearly, I don't want you to have this job. I've been waiting for you to pray this prayer for years. I would like you to leave St. Mary's. And I was like, uh, let's back that truck up. Beep, beep, beep. Okay, for real, I don't want to leave St. Mary's. That's where I wanted to start with this prayer, actually. Um, so make it so that I don't leave St. Mary's, okay? And he's like, no. I want you to leave your job, bald man. I'm like, oh, go. Oh. And I wrestled with God like Jacob wrestled with God for months. And then finally, I couldn't do it anymore, and I quit. I did not have a job. And I'm going to teach you something, a principle about following God or listening to your superiors that God has given, and it's a right command that they've given you. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And I didn't want to be disobedient, and I quit my job, and my wife and I freaked out because we didn't know what was going to happen. But the reason why I had to quit that job was so that a new generation could come in, the ones that I had already trained and mentored, the ones that I'm still mentoring, you know, a group of them at St. Mary's, and so that I could go do stuff with other people because God wanted me to use me in other ways. And I had to get out of the way of my own plan so that he could have a better one. There are dangerous prayers out there. And sometimes I think we give into these temptations that God has bad stuff he wants to give us. And at the moment, we don't even understand what it is. And sometimes God wants to prune. Okay, so your emotions, how you feel does not determine truth. How you feel does not determine truth. But here's the other thing. What you think doesn't determine truth. God determines what is true. And he built it right into reason and logic and nature, right? This is why we have science and philosophy and theology, and we can understand and grow in these, you know, things. And he gave us the gifts of our logic so we could know it. But he also gave us prayer when there are spiritual truths, and we can't just figure them out on our own. And we have to discern these things. And discernment comes from a deep understanding of what God wants of us by looking at the situation in life, and then opening it up to the possibilities that God wants to give us, not just our own. So sometimes praying is like flying through a fog. You can't go by sight. you got to go by your instruments. And the instruments of a pilot on a plane, it's going to be, you know, his keep it level, what, you know, what the altimeter is and all the other stuff, the speeds and other stuff. He's looking at his dials, right, or her dials. And, you know, you got to keep it level. You want to go do what the... And the intellectual assent to the truth of Jesus Christ and the relationship that goes with it is what we really need to do. And we can't just rely on our spiritual sweet tooth. And what I mean by that is, I don't know about you, but I pro- you've probably had really good experiences in prayer, like highs, consolations, and other stuff, right? Maybe last night was one of them in adoration. And if all we seek out is that, then we've got a spiritual sweet, sweet tooth. Sometimes it's going to be the day-to-day, I'm not actually into this, but I'm going to do it. And let me put it this way. How many of you guys are parents? changed a diaper in the middle of the night or had a kid throw up all over you? Yeah? You ever want to do the throw up cleanup? Anybody ever like, this is amazing. I'm pretty sure there are hot dogs in here. (laughs) No, (laughs) unless you're just really freaky. Okay? No, nobody wants that. Okay? So the fact is that's hard, but you do it. Why? Why? Because you love your kids and your family. It's the right thing to do. When you go to pray and you don't feel like it, you go sometimes because it's the right thing to do and you love God. Which, which pleases God more? The prayer that comes easy where you get a lot out of it or the prayer that's difficult and you do anyway? It's the second. 
It pleases God because you had to make a tougher choice. And there's a bug right there. See? Go away, enemy. I, I reject you. It's that second. It's difficult. And God, it pleases his heart, okay? So don't rely on that others. So I got to skip a little bit here. And you guys know most of this stuff, okay? You got to intercede for others and pray with others. And that's what we're about to do. Okay, so evangelization and problems in prayer. Da, da, da. Okay, we're done. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to pray. Um, look, here, here's the thing. I'm going to teach you one of the skills I'm going to actually teach tomorrow, and then we're going to do it. You ready? This is how we're going to end this session, okay? And so I'm giving you a forecast for the way we're going to run tomorrow's session, which is going to be very different than the one we just did, okay? Tomorrow is practical skills of how to go be an evangelist. I'm going to make you do stuff. So you want to talk about getting uncomfortable? I'll make everybody in here get uncomfortable. This is the kind of stuff I make bishops and priests do and Catholic leaders all the time, okay? When... Because I don't assume that people know how to do this stuff because they don't teach this stuff in seminary and grad school. And unless you actually go do it, you don't know how. Like preaching the gospel, giving your testimony, and praying with others. So when I meet people, I regularly ask for prayers. I say, and I like a server at a restaurant, I'll start chatting them up. How you doing? You having a good day? Give them a smile. They ask how I'm doing, and I'll crack a joke. Well, I'm, I'm not so good yet because I haven't had the caffeine, and I'm a grumpy, surly old man before I get my caffeine. Like, me too. I need my coffee. And I'm like, yeah, coffee's like the angel dropping out brown drips of grace and love straight out of heaven onto my tongue. And they're like, oh, you're funny, bald man. Not really. Ask my wife. She doesn't laugh at any of my jokes anymore. So anyway, so here I'm chatting up this person, you know, and they come back. Hey, oh, need anything else? No, I'm doing fine. But how you been today? It's been busy out here today. Oh, it's been real busy. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's been crazy because, you know, my kid back home, you know, they're, I just had one of my kids move back and she's pregnant and, you know, her boyfriend got her pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll say, oh, man, that's tough. What's her name? So and so, oh, I'm going to pray for her. Comes, you know, lady, at the end of it, brings the check. Hey, so I'm going to pray for your daughter, Sarah. You know, do you mind if we pray right now? Yeah. Here's the thing. Out of people I ask, do you have a prayer intention? Nine out of 10 of those people respond with a prayer intention. They will tell me something. These are people. Did you know that the vast majority of people who self-identify as atheists actually pray regularly? Yeah. What are they praying to? Right? So anyway, we're going to talk about that kind of stuff tomorrow, but they'll respond. Nine out of 10 people will give you an intention. And when I say, do you want to pray right now? Nine out of 10 people actually say yes. As long as I've done a little bit of that prep work of being like not a jerk guy, right? So here's what I want you to do. And I want you to do this with somebody you don't know so that we get a little bit uncomfortable. I want you to go find somebody you don't know, ask them for a personal intention. And here's what I mean by personal. I have to actually draw this out of the guys. I, like I say, hey, all right, okay, the other day, on Tuesday morning, I was in my hotel room doing a small group on Zoom because one guy's in Utah, one guy, I'm here. We're all in three different time zones this week, so we couldn't do it in person. And I say at the end of it, okay, Jeff, Bo, and James, what are we going to pray for? I need personal prayer intentions. And they're like, well, let's pray for my wife. Let's pray for my kids. I'm like, stop. We will pray for those people. I want to know what you personally, spiritually need prayers for right now. Oh, man. Well, I'm really struggling right now with like, um, you know, loving my kids when they annoy the heck out of me. Okay, well, let's, we can pray for that, right? That's what I want you to tell the other person, and I want you to ask of them. And then I want you to pray. So one person's going to go, next person's going to go. And you're going to pray for each other. Okay, this is how we're going to end this session. Once you're done praying, you can leave. Or if you want other prayer, you can come to me and I will pray with you, okay? But I'm going to stay, I'm going to just go in the back, right outside the doors, and we're going to do that. Okay, so what? Okay, we got three minutes to do this. Go find somebody, ask them their prayer intentions, give them to them, somebody you don't know, and pray with them.